so than anyone, we welcome you. We welcome you individually. We welcome you corporately. We welcome you in this city, in this region, in our state. Yeah. The government that you would bring to your house, God's government. Welcome that. The conviction you would bring. We welcome it, Holy Spirit. Personally, corporately, even nationally. We welcome conviction, Holy Spirit. We welcome that prodding of our hearts that causes us to run to you, to turn fully to you, to turn away from all that is not you, and turn fully to you. To be rewired completely from within to without. To have the mind of Christ rather than our own natural mindedness, eternal mindedness. To be under your hand rather than under our own control. Yeah. Yeah. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We would not grieve you. Forgive us for grieving you. Forgive your church in our region for grieving you, Holy Spirit. Forgive the church in our nation for grieving you. Spirit to teach us once again, to train us, to fill us. We ask for it, Holy Spirit. We ask for you to be all that you are in us. Not just what we know, what we don't know, not just what we've seen, what we've not seen, or heard about or ever even considered. There is a life in you, Holy Spirit, that is far beyond what we have ever known, or ever read about, or ever seen. We're tired of the crumbs from the table. You caught us to the feast. Thank you, Lord. I have to say something to Bill and Meg. I believe it's from the Lord, or I wouldn't say it, but this is a transition time, and, and you did well as well. Transition time. I know this is natural, but I'm going to say this because the Lord said it to me. Uh, I know that you guys came out of the service, the Lord brought you out of it. But what you have witnessed in His house, in various places, has been service. But here at the end, you will be the burning ones that the Lord spoke about. I saw the testimony of the Lord as a torch in your hands. Right. That was his testimony. It was his message. But you were living torches as messengers. And God called you to be that. Way back, that was the initial call to be his messengers. To be living torches, burning ones for him. And it will be so in this hour. I release to you the fire of God, the consuming fire that He is, His message of fire. Here's what the Lord told me to tell you. In these days, the Lord will be saying, 
as the fourth man in the fire. That's where you will find it, in the fire. He releases fire to you. Shut up in your very bones. That fire will gather and that fire will scatter. Nevertheless, He releases it to you. To be the messengers. To be the burning ones. He called you to be. Set apart to Him. And apart from the nonsense of this final hour. true spirit of prophecy will be strong on you. The Lord is giving you the book of Daniel in this time. You will be surrounded, as it were, by that book, the book of Daniel. And the testimony of Jesus, the true spirit of prophecy, will be strong in you. Rod, the Lord told me to tell you He's coming to you at night. He's going to encounter you. You're going to see Him. You're going to be hopeful. God has given you eyes to see, Rod. And I just want to pray for your eyes. I mean spiritually right now. And you will see with greater clarity than you've ever seen. Because the Lord desires to give you incredible spiritual sight in this time. Sight that will allow the Lord to pluck some out of the fire. To use you as a vessel. To speak the truth in love that causes people to come up out of the ditch of religion and into the Isaiah 40 way. He's coming to you, Rod. Right? I just need to pray this over here. Release to you the audible voice of the Lord in the night seasons. Steve and Joan, I'll just share with you what I saw. I saw something, uh, and this is beautiful in and of itself, but beyond uh, oil, and lots of oil, I saw the Lord ignite with fire. And you're going to experience, and those with you are going to experience not just oil, they're going to experience fire and oil in this time. fire, Lord, yes. in our age. Yes. It has been foretold that there would be a spirit baptism in fire. Yes. We believe and we receive. Yes, yes Lord. Yes. share a little bit of the Holy Spirit. I, the Lord dealt with me early this morning to share a little bit about the Holy Spirit again. And I'm going to do it. So uh, I want us to look at two specific passages. Um, one is in Galatians chapter 3. And then uh, Romans 8 as well. Friends, uh, the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost, but not all received it. 
has been sent into the world. And uh, I'm afraid that that uh, the church as it presently stands, I'm being general in my remarks, but I'm speaking of, of Western culture, Christianity particularly now, the church as it presently stands is almost devoid of the Holy Spirit. And that's not a boast. I mean, that's a something of sadness that is grieving. It's grieving the heart of God. It should be grieving us, the people of God, that we have established what we have established. And much of it, if not all of it, without the Holy Spirit is a sad thing indeed. People can say, man, what a feat. I say, what a travesty. God is being misrepresented as much as he's being represented by what is presently called the church. That's not meant to be harsh. It's simply a fact. Blind men can see it. It's how little of the Holy Spirit we have. Not just the Holy Spirit blessing. I'm talking about the government of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about him ruling and reigning in the house of God. Not meetings. We the people of God out there. His absolute dominion within us. The life of God flowing through us. There's something much deeper than just blessing. And I'm afraid that's what we categorize the Holy Spirit as. Is the blesser rather than the life giver. The child trainer. We've almost completely missed now the true work of the Holy Spirit. We've made it concerning a few elements that we particularly like without the challenge of giving up anything. So here in Galatians, Paul says this to the church there. Verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You know, it would be easy to say, well, you know, he's just using words. No, no, no. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Sorcery. Yeah. Instead of the Holy Spirit. Tell me that's not what's going on in the church. The church is under delusion. It is under a false spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Much of it. What has opened the doorway to that? It's real simple. Natural man in charge of God's house. That is the open to the spirit of Antichrist. You want to know how the Antichrist is going to have so much power in what's called the church in the last days? It's because of our present condition. We are the open door. Our resistance to the Holy Spirit. Our desire to be in control of our own lives. Of the house of God. It's on every level. I refuse to, our refusal to repent deeply truly turned is an open door to the spirit of Antichrist. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 3, John goes right at this issue. Even in that day. There were many Antichrists in the church already. And when you read that passage, what you'll discover in that passage is that they were manifesting themselves. Same thing is going on today. The open door to the Antichrist is not perhaps as devious as what we would think. It just takes natural man, carnal man, in place of the Holy Spirit. Good ideas. Good God ideas versus God. Fellowship without the Holy Spirit. Fellowship that is carnal, that is natural. The church has substituted formulas. It's substituted all types of gatherings, all types of things for the Holy Spirit. And believe me, I, and I'm going to be very candid this morning. Uh, you, you may never want to come back. I would blame you. Um, when Elijah came to me over the past couple of years, has continued to do so, and uh, Gabriel particularly uh, being sent uh, along with Elijah, 
What's going to lead the way in our time for the Holy Spirit's return to the church is going to be a baptism of repentance. Yes. Yeah. Nothing else. You want to yeah. attract the Holy Spirit? Repent. Yeah. And don't just repent for sins. Repent for our lack of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Repent for ourselves in the way of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Repent for allowing all that we've experienced and known up to the present to become the boundary yeah. that resists the Holy Spirit from taking us <laughs> on the ground that we have never known and ever seen. I tell you, in this generation, we have seen so little of the will of God, so little of the purpose of God, so little of the desire of God. And it has become a hindrance to how far it has become a hindrance to our interpretation of all things and where this is meant to go. God would disrupt us by the Holy Spirit first. Yes. Repentance is a disruption. Yes. And it is a deep disruption to the very core of our beings. There is nowhere around this, folks. The measure of our brokenness will result in the measure of His fullness. Nothing else will. Without brokenness and perpetual brokenness, we will not have perpetual fullness. Yes. We are in the way. You are in the way. I am in the way. Stop finger pointing at God. You're the problem. So am I. Told you I offend you. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to be real. We can dance around this issue or we can come to it. We can take the challenge or we can get offended. And if we can be that easily offended, where does that leave the Holy Spirit? Tickling people's ears aren't helping them. We need the Holy Spirit desperately. Yes. We need our boundaries reset. We need what we, we've got to understand this, what we have seen and what we have known has been so minuscule of what God has desired. Yes. You want to know why people check out of the church? This is why. Sorcery is better than what we presently have in the house of God. So the enemy is extraordinarily good at his schemes. The schemes we're presently going through started months ago. The schemes that the church is presently giving into started years ago. We're only reacting to what the enemy's been planning. Paul said the church was not to be unaware of the schemes, but we had become almost completely unaware of them. We just stumble right into them. Fall into them and thus fall. Sorry, to, I'm just being honest with you. I'm being straightforward with us in this. It's our lack of spiritual sight because it comes from the Holy Spirit. It's lack of hearing which comes from the Holy Spirit. Our lack of discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. Our lack of understanding, living understanding, it comes from the Holy Spirit. And the measure of the Holy Spirit in us. What does it look like and what would it look like to have full measuredness of the Holy Spirit among the people of God? We have never seen it. We don't even know what we're talking about. It wasn't in the book of Acts. And that's way beyond where we're at. And we can't replicate what they did back there and get to where they were. It's not a formula. It's the Holy Spirit. Many have made that mistake. Well, we'll do what they did and we'll have what they have. You'll never have what they had by doing what they did. They didn't know what they were doing. Right. That's God's ground. Yes. Yes. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Yes. It wasn't a formula. It wasn't a plan. They failed as much as they hit the mark. But they kept going. They appointed elders who didn't know. Mark and I were talking about this morning. They appointed elders who didn't know what they didn't know. And then they had to take them all down. You know that. You've read the history. This is what happens when man gets in charge. Then they have to come up with some God-given rules for elders and deacons. But that comes later. I'm simply pointing to something. What happens when the Holy Spirit gets set aside and we try to build the church? What happens when it's more important to us that people come rather than that the Holy Spirit remains? I'm not looking for numbers. Neither is God. 
Growth is not numbers. It's the measure of the fullness of Christ. It's true. Say, what well, is God after people? Sure He is. But He's going to have us on His ground, not ours. Going after numbers has opened the door to the fear of man in the church. God loves people, but listen, I have to say something to you. But He has an expectation of them coming out from where they are to where He is. He's not coming to live with them on their ground. Ever. That is a wake-up call to the church. We think we've got to get people in here. They have to know. Do we? There's a difference between the Holy Spirit drawing people and me right. doing it. Right. You know that? Lest the Holy, here's what the Scripture has to say about that. Lest the Holy Spirit draws a person, they cannot come. That should change the way we think. Yes. And it should change the way we operate. Present day church is after many, many things. Most of it natural and carnal. God is looking for a people that He can fill with Himself. The representatives of God here on the earth. That kind of vessel. We'll never get there in this present system. And I'm really not talking about the system here. I am, but I'm not. I'm talking about something a little deeper than that. I'm talking about this type of system where man is in control rather than the Holy Spirit. It isn't really at that point so much what we do. It's what we don't have. The Holy Spirit can work within many and has worked within many systems if He's given place. I say that because people think, well, if we would do it you know, the right way, what is the right way? It's the Holy Spirit in charge. And this is what gets man because we want it ordered. It's got to be well ordered. God's order to us would look like chaos. It's true. Get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do something. That's His own. He knows what He's doing. Now, we're going to have to trust Him in this. You know that? I've gone to Bible college and I've been around ministers and so have you. And I'm just telling you what is common thought around almost all of them, 90 something percent of them. Well, there's got to be order. And by that they need, somebody's got to be in charge. But I think that needs to be the Holy Spirit. Has it come to that? It absolutely has. Yes. Somewhere down the line, the Holy Spirit's going to have to wrestle the control issue out of our hands, pin us like He did Jacob, and give us a whole other attitude, a whole other outlook, and a whole other desire. And that's exactly what I'm praying for. How about you? I want to be pinned. And when I get up, I want to walk differently. With a limp for the rest of my life, remembering that incident when the Holy Spirit took me down, broke my control spirit, Broke everything revolving around me, crushed me, broke me, bruised me, and I came up a different person. Yes. Yes. Without that, we're whistling in the wind. I'm going to put a simple question out to all of us. Have you been broken? And I don't mean by pain. I don't mean at the loss of loved ones or things you loved. I mean by God. Have you been broken? Have you been in a wrestling match with the Almighty and He has pinned you? And broken you. You cannot be trusted until that's true. No one can be. And God will not entrust much of Himself until that's true. <clears throat> so, I hope I'm not offending you too bad. But I'm telling you though, folks, it's true. We are never going to arrive at fullness with a self-centered attitude of I've got it all together. We're going to arrive there broken vessels who have nothing good in them but Christ. Yes. Amen. Nothing. Yes. Yes. Nothing redeemable. Nothing that the Father is after. I'm telling you that's the truth. 
There's nothing in us that He is after other than Christ and His fullness in us. It's a hard fact, isn't it? You say, well, he, doesn't He love us? He does love us. But if we're going to come into the fullness of love, there's, there's different types of love. There's a Creator-created love. Is that all we want? We weren't made for that. Does that be true? There's a deeper love called salvific love. But that's a love that rescues. But we were invited into a much deeper love than that. Deeper love than that. We were invited into a marriage. We were invited into oneness. I don't mean becoming deity. I mean, I mean becoming a vessel filled with Him. We were invited into a relationship to where He has absolutely come within us in a way that He cannot in any of the rest of the creation to rule and reign and set up His very throne inside of us, among us, and then through us to rule His creation. That relationship is not accessed by fact of creation. That relationship is not accessed by salvation. It is a choice. Before there was a need for salvation, that choice existed. When man was first created, before it came. The bridal paradigm was already there. The two must become one. There it is. Genesis 2. We must understand the Holy Spirit has been so grieved primarily because we have been able to do church without it. Whatever that means. That kind of makes me sick. Do church. What does that even mean? What about be? Be the people of God. 24-7, wherever we're at, there the Lord is. When we come together, it's beautiful, but no more beautiful than when we're out here. So, here in Galatians, this is what Paul is saying to them. I want to get to this. Verse 2, this is the only thing I want to ask from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or in the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And that's the Word of God to, to, to the church. Yeah. Having begun in the Spirit. Are we continuing there? Is the Holy Spirit more in fullness in this hour than He was in the book of Acts? That's a good test. I said again, the book of Acts wasn't the fullness of fullness. It was not. It was the beginning. But you see, in Acts is a beginning. But isn't it true, Rod? We've fallen from that. We've fallen from what we saw in the beginning. It has been a testament to man throughout what's been the Pentecostal time over the last 100 or so years that to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to have certain external phenomenon happening to our bodies. Power and gifts. I'm not saying that's not elements. They're elements. And uh, you may respond uniquely and funny to the Holy Spirit coming on you. Don't ever tell the Holy Spirit you won't do something. Because He'll be determined to do that or anything. Don't ever tell the Holy Spirit you won't go someplace. Because you'll find yourself there sooner or later. Why? Because he's in a wrestling match with the human will. The soul of man. And whatever limitation you put in front of God, he aims to break it. To crush it. To grind you to power. Let's get this straight. God's aim is to grind us to power. So that Christ can be revealed in us. And that's not destroying your personality. The truth is, our soul is so strong, we don't know what our personality is. It's yet to emerge. Yet to emerge. We're under so self-control that our personality, which is of the Spirit, 
is dead. And our soul is alive. And we're following it. And it's ruling. And it's governing. And it's in the church. It's over the church. It's intricately interwoven within the fabric of the church. Isn't that true? We cannot tell the distinction anymore between goosebumps and the Holy Spirit. Reactions to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. Which I say again, there will be lots of reactions. I've had lots of reactions to the presence of God. Some of them wanting to die reactions. <clears throat> Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Those are wonderfully terrifying. So, but yet, there's still a distinction. One of the clearest signs, I want to get to this, of the Holy Spirit is found in Romans 8. This is the other passage. Romans chapter 8. I'm just barely touching this, but uh, I didn't want to take up too much time. In Romans 8, beginning with verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To reverse that, say there is condemnation to all who are not in Christ Jesus. That's equally true. That's what uh, Romans chapter 2 says. They're under wrath. Just want to point that out because in this day and age, that's not uh, we have a different gospel that has arisen, which is not the gospel of Christ. It is an Americanized gospel yes. that is uh, that is devoid of much of the truth of the scriptures. It's just true. It is if I were to put it in terms of food. Here's the way the modern gospel in our nation. Here's the type of food it is. It is a Danish and not meat. It is confectionery. It is the easy way. It's the sweet way. Speak to us sweet words. Speak to us smooth words. Speak to us enticing words. Speak to us those things that tickle our ears. Speak to us those things that are sweet. Do not tell me the truth. Do not tell me the cost. Do not tell me of the battle. And I could come home with us. But anyone who's been in the Lord at any length of time knows something about battle. Anybody in this room know what I'm talking about? Anybody been in a battle in this room? Anybody know there's a cost to going beyond the fact of being saved and coming into why you were really created? Because you weren't created to be saved. That's not why you were created. None of us in this room were created. God never saved anybody for the purpose of saving them. Ever. You're not saved so you can be saved. You're saved to come into original intent. Original thought. It is illogical to believe that original thought was to be saved. If original thought in God was to be saved, then Adam had to fall. And if he didn't do so on his own, God himself would trip him up. So he could come into the fullness. Salvation. But that's illogical to believe that. Salvation was added by necessity. Original intent was a bride. It was a whole creation of humanity singularly meant to be that bride. All of it. Not a part of it. All of creation. Of the creation of humanity was meant to be a bride. All of it. The fall ensured that only a small portion would come into that. That the way would be narrow and few would be there that find it. I'm just quoting the scriptures, which I seem to find a great lack of in these days. In these doctrines that are floating around through the church. No, folks, it's confectionary doctrines. It makes you feel good. I'm not against feeling good. But God's more than a feeling. And if I feel bad, does that, that make God less? Is God affected at all by my emotions? Does it change His personality? Does it change the fact of His love? Does it change His desire? Does it change His purpose? Not in a bit. At least bit. Isn't that true? He's not changed at all. But what changes us? We do all the changing, not Him. Well, anyway. Verse 2. 
from the law, listen to this, of the spirit of life. Now, now we come to a purpose of the Holy Spirit that is very clear in the Scriptures. Yes. He is called the spirit of life. Yes. He's not the blessing machine maybe we have thought Him to simply be. He is the blesser of the people of God. But there's more need for different types of blessings in this hour than what we have seen if we are going to go deeper. And if our hearts are not fullness, we're out of sync with the Holy Spirit. can't say that any plainer. If our desire is to not go on to the fullness of God, and that by the Spirit, we're out of sync with the Holy Spirit. Having begun, chapter 3 of Galatians says, in the Spirit. There's a beginning that's in the Spirit, that's only in the Spirit. That where we're not from this earth anymore. We are from above. We are to be seated with Him. I want you to think about this around our fellowship. I'm not talking about this group. I'm talking about our fellowship as God's people with one another. It is our fellowship of an eternal nature. Remember this. Please remember this. These few short years that we are here are nothing but a vapor. And the rest of our existence will be completely and forever around God, who He is, and what He desires to do. It is meant to be now that way in the church. But we have deviated so far from that thinking and that it does, it does nothing for us anymore. We can't get along with that. We've got to have our parties. I'm sorry. There's one thing to say, well, let's have a party. There's another thing to say, we've got to have it. That uncovers something real quick. We are still carnal. We're still solical. We're still drawing off the energy of the flesh of one another. We are flesh eaters and death eaters. Tell me it's not true. Sorry, but I'm going to lay it out even more plain. There is a fellowship that is in God that has no bounds of this earth. It is outside of it. It is to be seated with Him in the heavenlies. There is a fellowship in that place that it cannot be broken. It cannot be shaken. And it cannot be destroyed. I've been in enough relationships and all of us have in this room. When it's just friendship, it can be easily shaken. Easily broken. Easily torn apart by our soul, by the clashing of our souls. God is offering us something that's absolutely on heavenly ground. It is in this world, but it is absolutely not of it. To love this world is to hate God. There is something that we've not seen. That's why I'm pushing for it. We've not experienced it. We've not known it. And thus, what has arisen in us is division. Yeah. Is that not true? Yeah. Dividedness and disunity is the order of the day because we're not willing to make the great migration to heavenly ground. Yeah. We're not willing to give up anything. We're not willing to allow God to go deep enough within our minds, within our memories, within our past to disrupt us. Yeah. To take the hunger for that out of us and replace it with a hunger for the heavenly. Yeah. We can have something we've never known if we want it. I say it's worth the journey. It's not ethereal. It's very practical. It is a people who are displaying, a people who are representing, a people who have the presence of God, and that presence of God is being released in them and through them on a perpetual basis on this earth. They are altogether other than the earthly. Altogether otherly, other than the worldly. They are other than. They are forever distinct by the heavenly characteristics of the life of the Holy Spirit within them. Somebody's got to say it. Yeah. We've circled this wagon way too many times. Yeah. Gone down the pass. Isn't that right, Bill? How many times have we gone down these paths? We go here, we go there. Those of us who have seen much of the world, we go here, we go there, looking for something we've never found. I have. I've looked for a fellowship. I've looked for a place in God. I've looked for a people in God. I've never found them. I've come to this realization. If you want it, God's going to have to start it. Because you're not going to find it. And if you do find it, you'll ruin it without that journey. Isn't that true? It's an inward journey. Isn't it yes. It's something inward that happens by the Holy Spirit within me. He disrupts me. He takes me down to the very core of everything and presses the reset button. Let's begin again. Because you're a wreck and a mess. And listen to this. And nothing, listen, we have to hear this. 
nothing that I desire to do with you can have any attachment to your past. You are all together then a new creation. You have never existed before. Yes. Well, what a journey. That's by the Spirit. It's this issue of life that most clearly defines the people of God. God's life. Isn't that true? Gifts can move, and they do. Thank God for them. We need the gifts of God. There's something deeper than that. You can have those gifts of God and things remain quite shallow. In the places I've been and some of us in this room, you can have the abundance of the gifts of God and things be quite immature, quite quarrelsome, quite challenging, quite on unholy ground. People are clamoring for attention, clamoring for, for position clamoring for recognition, clamoring for everything but what God wants us to have, fullness. And when we come to the end of all of that, and we've been burned, we living stones. Anybody been burned besides me? i not only been burned, i burned. I'm guilty on both parts. Repent of it. Don't want anything to do with it. There's a place in God that is entirely honorable, entirely pure, entirely holy. There's a place of trustworthiness, absolute beauty. A place where our life is no longer our own. We come to recognize we've been bought with the price. Therefore, we're to glorify God in these bodies. There's a place of reckoning, the dead reckoning of the cross of Christ and of the Spirit of Christ. We are completely other than what we once were. And our objective is to continue to broaden the distance between the former and the present. Not to keep, listen, not keep it as a buddy and a fallback thing just in case this doesn't work out. In my former life, I had this, and if this doesn't work out in God, I'll go back there. God, get that out of us. Yeah. Memories, those memories need to be crushed. Yeah. The There's no going back. There's only going up. Up. Well, life, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. I just want to point this out to us. What the church is lacking is the life of the Holy Spirit. More than anything else. Again, I'm not saying this to condemn us. I'm saying to prod my heart, your heart, to fullness, to press on. We have been burned, but that's not the end of this story, and it's not the end of our lives. And, uh, you know, if you've not been burned, go get a, into a part of the church that will burn you. I'd be glad to do it. Sorry. I remember one of my friends years ago wanted to be uh, a monk. Took off to the mountains and he used to write me letters, and, which were small books. <laughs> and uh, he would complain, you know, Terry, I'm just I'm concerned, I'm worried, I don't have anyone persecuting me. I said, of course not. Who's going to persecute you? The mountain lions and the bears out there? <laughs> I said, you want persecution? Come back to civilization and be a part of the church. They'll take care of you. Isn't that true? Yes. Way too often true. Anyway, I'm just terrible this morning. Right? <laughs> There's really not a burn in my saddle. It's no more so than any other time. I'm just amazed at the lack of the Holy Spirit to the same way that's in the church of Jesus Christ. How far we've drifted without him. And uh, brothers and sisters, we can't leave it there. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. And our purpose has been, this is why it's been this past, week, past few weeks, been this way, but it's going to continue. Is, is this issue of repentance leading the way? 
There's got to be a baptism, and there will be. That's what Elijah made very plain to me. There's going to be a baptism. The spirit and power of Elijah is going to lead to a baptism of, resp- of repentance in the church. In the church. That's not done with. We're at the beginning of the beginning of that. It will make way for the, the Holy Spirit who's been grieved by much of the church to come back into a portion of the church. I'm not saying all of it, but a portion of it. I wish it was all of it. So does the Holy Spirit. But He will not. He's just going to, I'm just being factual. He's not going to be welcomed by the majority of the church. The Antichrist is. Because what is the Antichrist? Give people what they want. Give them their fleshly desires. Give them their solical desires. Give them a replacement. Give them a form of Christianity. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it. Give them a form of Christianity that caters to their fleshly solical desires. That you can live for yourself and, and be in God's fullness. That's a lie. Well, much of the church in Western culture is susceptible to that spirit of Antichrist. A measure of it is already presently operating within it because of where we're at. I'm sounding an alarm. That's my purpose in saying what I'm saying this morning. If we continue on this path, and it seems to me that we're so far down this path that it's going to take the shakings of God... It has come to that that only the shakings of God can rescue us now. It's that serious. Only the judgments of can cause repentance in the, in the world. It's about there in the church. So judgment is beginning at the house of God. That judgment particularly revolves around our lack of Christ and His cross our lack of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. This issue of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the warning to the church, to the five churches, and to all the churches, this is said to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We are in a desperate time. And that is not the capability of the church to even hear what the Spirit is saying. You guys know five out of the seven churches were direct personal rebukes from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Threatening them to leave them. I will remove the candlestick from you. I will come and make war against you with the words of my mouth. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Here we are again. Well, the Holy Spirit being grieved, repentance is the way forward. And I believe this directly because I'm, I'm hitting around. There's so many things that's going on about this with encounters, and I'm being a little bit open about it. I'm not saying a lot about it. I can say a lot more about it. So many encounters around this, so many conversations about this issue of repentance. What if, and here's why we've gone here, what if we took it personally and we took it corporate? Not just for ourselves, though. It's too self-centered. For our region, for our state, for our nation, for the body of Christ in this nation, for the body of Christ in the nations, for the nation as a whole, for the lost. What if we took it personally to begin to repent before the Holy Spirit and are grieving Him and are doing it our way, the church should have wrote that song. And I did it my way. Because that's what it's been doing. I'm surprised Frank Sinatra got a chance to write it. The church has been writing that song. Maybe he got it from the church. I, I know that sounds funny, but folks, that's where we're at. We need the Holy Spirit. We yeah, yeah, needed him yesterday. Yeah. We need him today. Yeah. So I, I need to shut this down. So much more to say. Life. Here's what we're missing. We're missing the life of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. Individually, corporately, look at our nation. Look at the condition of the church in our nation. 
a casual glance will show that a form of Christianity has come up that is devoid of the life of the Spirit. It's a, listen to this. It's devoid of the values of the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's devoid of the acclaimed work that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do, such as convict. Yeah. Isn't that right? Bring judgment. We're devoid of those very things that we see in the book of Acts that where people are humbling themselves and repenting and coming to God. And God is, here's numbers, adding to the church. Right. That's numbers. And the church is growing. That's an issue of the increase of Christ. Yes. Growth is happening. The people are becoming. What? Transformed. Transfigured. It's this lack of values. Do we value the Holy Spirit's ability to transfigure us? Transform us? Is the gospel that's presently being preached about transformation? Is it about the cross of Christ? Is it about transfiguration? Those are common themes of the New Testament. They are, in fact, predominant themes of the New Testament. Isn't that right? You know the warnings of Galatians chapter 5 concerning evil there? And uh, let's just be point blank about lifestyles and behavior that is against God, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. Practice. We are in a war now, and that war more than anything else is for the Holy Spirit to take back the place of headship yes, yes. over his people. Yes. And for the mind of the spirit, there's a real wrestling point, versus the carnal mind in the church. And I'm talking about that that's born again. And for the nominal that's not born again, I'm talking about the church. The natural mind. Two things going on in the church. Natural mindedness. We're dealing with leaders who have no relationship with God. They're not born again. They don't they not know Him. That's right. And that leading entire congregations and entire denominations. Yeah. That's the condition. On top of that, we have a remnant who are born again, but who are carnally minded. Still trying to do it ourselves. Still trying to get there by our own strength. Still trying to live for God rather than allowing Christ to live in us. Still making the same old mistakes, the same failures without recognizing the absolute demand for the Holy Spirit in us. He alone is the power and the strength of God to pull this thing off. Yeah, yeah. So to speak, that's a terrible way of saying it. It's like a crime. <laughs> but I'm talking about something good. I'm talking about only God can do this. Only God in you can be that life in you that is pleasing to God. Isn't that true? Yes. Our desperateness for the Holy Spirit is on every front. We don't need Him a little. Without Him, we have nothing of true Christianity. Yes. Yes. We don't have anything of true representation. God Himself is not among us in the way, at least in the way of fullness. We cannot leave it at that. So this is my point. This has been our point of humbling ourselves and repenting. We're repenting, yes, for our own personal sins, for our own grieving of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I repent of my control factor in my life to want to govern myself, direct myself, please myself, my soul. I repent of my soul strength. Because the strength of the soul is a direct avenue for the for the advent of the spirit of Antichrist. Personally, corporately. That's the warning. Church is going to embrace the Antichrist. It is. He's going to offer everything that we we talk about, except for Christ, Him crucified. He's going to offer religion. He's going to offer a worldwide religion where there's peace and there's so-called unity. It won't last, but He's going to offer it. He's going to offer many ways to God. The soul's going to eat that up before it's already begun. 
It's already begun. What we're talking about has already begun. That's why I'm warning us about it. That if our soul, if we do not allow the Holy Spirit to get in our soul now, I tell you what can happen here. Say, so, well, man, I would never take the mark. The mark's not just some outward thing. The mark comes from us being in alignment with the Antichrist spirit internally. We will never be able to discern that mark without a disruption of the Holy Spirit within us and coming on to heavenly ground. So there's not going to be anything physical? Yes, but folks, it's going to begin in the Spirit. That's the way it always begins. We're going to have to be marked by the Holy Spirit. We need to be marked on our foreheads by the name of our Father and by the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the bride, by the way, and marked by the Lamb of God, His new name. Or we're going to be marked by the Antichrist. We're coming to a time where we're not going to be able to buy or sell here shortly. What are we going to do? Cave in? Anyway, is that too much information? I'm trying to scare us. I'm trying to be real with us. No, I'm not setting dates. I'm telling you we're in a seven-year time frame here. By the end of the seven-year time frame, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you can't buy or sell. It has begun. It's not going to. It has. That seven-year time frame has begun. God the Spirit. Let's be specific. I'll close with this. Let's look specifically now, not random. The Holy Spirit's not random. The Holy Spirit is moving very specifically, very directly, strategically after this issue of self in the body of Christ. I'm telling you, He is, how many find this to be true? He is hammering that issue. Yes. It is for our salvation. And I'm not talking about being born again. I'm talking about a deliverance from the growing spirit of Antichrist that is both in the church and in our nation. He is hammering this issue. The essence of the Antichrist spirit is the self life. Yeah. Satan didn't have a soul, but all that he took of was self. <coughs> so I'm saying to us, so the Holy Spirit is intentionally now going after this thing of self life. Hammering it. He's wanting to plunder the depths of our very being. He's wanting to burn like fire within us. All that that's wood, hay, and stubble within us. All that is of my own human will, my own reasoning. That's, that's really the mind issue. is human reasoning. Our own human will. Our own emotions. He's hammering this issue. He's going after love's priority. The love of God, God, loving God being first in our lives. First and a huge gulf between first and second. Wouldn't you agree? There has to be. God establish it in me. God establish a huge gulf between the love of God and, and anything else. Because if I have that right, I'm going to tell you something. You have that right, I have that right, the love of God. We're going to love people in a way that is impossible for us without the love of God. You love your family? God loves them way more. And if we'll embrace the love of God, we'll come into that love. It's not just something, something He takes. It's something He gives. We can stay on the secondary levels or we can come into where we've been called to be seated with Him in the heavens. We are only seeing it as something He takes. We're not seeing it as something coming into it. I'm saying this to us. Getting out of Egypt is not our deliverance. Coming into Canaan is. Just getting out, folks, is not enough. We have to enter in. We have to come into the fullness. We are meant to. I'm determined to. How about you? Everything that's up against you is to keep you from that. Coming into fullness. Stay where you're at. If Satan can't get you to retreat, just remain where you're at. Go no further. Effectiveness is tied around this issue of fullness. Usefulness is tied around this issue. I want, I want, I got to end. So I want to say something to us. I want to say a challenge to us. What if we threw aside all the nonsense we've ever known in Christianity? What if we were done with it? What if we were done with the pressure of it, the fear of man that's in it, 
The desire to please man. The desire to be like this one, that one. What if we threw all that stuff aside like we should have done from the very beginning and become the people of God that He called you to be? To represent Him on this earth. To be a fearless warrior that He called you to be in this hour. For God to finally have a vessel that He can fully manifest Himself through us and call people out to Himself. Not the church, to Himself. That's what He wants. We would be that people. I want to be a part of those burning ones. That's what I was talking about with Daniel and Bill and Meg. We are invited to something so much greater than what we've known. We can't compare it to anything we've ever known. Even what we've read. And some of that's so beautiful. Different parts of the world. Things that have gone on even in recent times. Absolutely beautiful. But I tell you from the Lord, there's something way more beyond and beautiful than that. There's a representation of God on this earth here in these final days that will be unsurpassed and unprecedented. In fact, here's what the Lord told me. If you were to put everything together collectively that has ever occurred in the past, it will not go beyond what I'm about to do. He is after something. But it's going to take a fearlessness and a wholeheartedness to go all the way with Him in this. And you're going to walk alone in it much of the time. This is not a lie. I'm sorry to say this to you. This is not a lie where you're going to just find people tripping over you to get to God. You're going to find yourself out there saying to people, let's go. And you're going to find yourself like the Lord. Let's go, but I'm not coming back to get you. I'm going on. Follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus said, leave your nets and come. He didn't go down there and say, well, let's go fishing for a while. And then one of these days, we'll get away from fishing and we'll become something else. He's very dramatic in what he did. He tells the rich young ruler, go sell everything you have. Can you see what's going on here? Here's the offer to us. Do you want your stuff or do you want the Lord? You can't have both. I can't have both. We want the Lord in fullness. The former things have to go. Handle the things of the world but make sure they don't have control. Keep a constant vigilance and diligence in this arena. That those things don't get my heart. They don't grab it. My heart is reserved for the Lord. It is His. I believe that's about all of us in this room. There's enough of us in this room to turn this region upside down. And there's others that aren't in this room. I'm simply saying those who are in the room this morning. There's enough of us to see this region turned upside down. It will become the burning ones he called us to. Human torches for yes. God. Yes. Burning. You cannot kiss a consuming fire unless you aim to become part of it. You can't marry it. That you're going to become one with. That's the only way to survive the consuming fire he is. We must join. We must join. I need to join. Not running. Many of us in this room have been so boxed in all our Christian lives. God, break the box this morning. I ask that of the Holy Spirit. Break up our boxes. We have yet to see all that God wants. How many agree with me on that? How many of you just stand and say, that's true of me? I have yet to see what God originally intended, what God originally spoke of. He had it all in view. I want the fullness, and I am determined to go on into that fullness. I will not labor for vain things any longer. My heart will not be captivated by the temporal. I want my heart to be fully His, burning on fire 